Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our last call of the year, The American Experiment, Our Nation's Past, Present, and Future in the Words of Our Greatest Novelist with Professor Joseph Lucy. I am Kimmy, and I'm the rewards event coordinator here at the Dallas Morning News. And on behalf of all of us, I wanted to say thank you so much for joining us today. We are very happy to have you. Please remember that we will have a live Q&A towards the end of the call, and we highly encourage your questions. Joseph, you're welcome to take it from here. Thank you so much, Kimmy. Uh, it's, a, it's a thrill and a joy to be here. I'm very excited about today's talk um, for a lot of different reasons. One, I think it's a, a, a nice talk as we, as we start to get towards the holiday season and we spend time with, with family and loved ones and, you know, reflect back on the year and, and all the things that have happened and also think about, you know, what it means to live uh, in this country and, and to, to be part of the, the American experience. And, you know, in a way, the, the, the term the American experiment uh, goes back really to the founding of the country when a lot of the people were wondering if America would, you know, how long would the American experiment with democracy last, right? We, during the Revolutionary War, we fought a much uh, more powerful nation. We were the kind of the ones that were, um, you know, just a, a, a small part of this, this great British empire. And yet we established our independence. We, you know, we forged ahead with democracy. And that sense of, of America being an experiment, that's a term that one will find uh, in early American history. And I, I think it lingers to the present because America is always reinventing itself. We're always you know, finding new voices, finding new ways to come to terms with the American experiment experience. And I think literature and books is a huge part of what constitutes that American experience and American experiment. And if I could just you know, tell a personal story um, as we get into our talk, in, in some ways it's ironic that I should be giving this talk because I actually grew up in an immigrant home. My family immigrated from Italy and my parents, who were both incredibly hardworking and um, you know, intelligent people who, who pushed us to do well in school, they themselves, um, well, I shouldn't say always pushed us to do well in school because in a way that school was an alien world to them. They had an, a grade school education, but they knew how, how important school was to us and to our, our life in this country. And, but it was a house with no books in it, you know, because we, we, my parents didn't have the, the, the benefit of an education because they – grew up surrounded by so much difficulty. Um, the, the land they came from in southern Italy was, was on the whole very poor, and so it was really moving to America and the United States in hope of giving us a better life, which we were very lucky to have. So it wasn't a house with books, but it was a house with stories. And this is what I always tell my own children, and, you know, uh, that it's not it, – stories are what matter, to be able to share stories. So my parents would tell me all the about our relatives, the world they left behind, and they were amazing storytellers. And I think that gave me from a young age this love of narrative, this love of what would become a life in books. And when I think about what these what the what stories and books mean to the American tradition, I'm immediately reminded of, you know, there was a, 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 um, a book written by Philip Roth called The Great American Novel. And it's actually a novel about baseball. And it's not one of Philip Roth's best books. But he talked a little bit about the question of the great American novel. And there was an, uh, an epigraph from uh, Frank Norris, an American poet, who said, is the great American novel a dodo or a hippogriff? You know, so in other words, is it, is it, a, a um, an endangered species or an extinct species, the dodo, which used to be very numerous, but unfortunately have been wiped out, or is it a kind of mythical figure, you know, like the hippogriff, that half horse, that half um, that half winged creature of fantasy that you, you that we, we read about in Harry Potter. And basically, he's saying, who will write the great American novel? Can it even be done, or is it just 
you know, a dream. And so when we think of the quest for the great American novel, when we think about, you know, the way writers throughout history have tried to meet that challenge, I think of it somewhat differently. I don't think of the great American novel, that book that describes American experience as either a dodo or a hippogriff. I think of it as a white whale. I think of Moby Dick, right? And I think of Herman Melville's great novel about Captain Ahab's quest for the white whale, this creature that is half fantasy, half real. So half part dodo, half part hippogriff, right? But something that we pursue, even if we know, we know we might never catch it, you know? There's something about the pursuit of the great American novel, that novel that sums up American life, that is that is really seduced and haunted writers for centuries. Now, why do I think it's so important to turn to our writers and understanding what life in America is like? Because it's like I tell my students, I think of literature as almost like a, uh, like a fossil, you know. It's something, where we understand dinosaurs live, we, we've never seen a dinosaur, but we find their remains, you know, we find their, 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 their fossils, the imprint they leave in shales, their, in, in, in stones, and in in, we see the, the you know, the, the remnants of their bones, and it's like this trace of these great creatures that once lived. I think similarly, if you think about literature, it's made up, it's make believe, but it really reveals, just like a fossil does, the way people used to live, right? When you read, say, The Great Gatsby, you're taken inside life in America in the 1920s. It's made up, but it's true. You feel the energy of you know, the, um, the, the roaring 20s, the jazz age. You feel when there's that line in The Great Gatsby, um, you know, when, uh, when Fitzgerald describes women were putting their heads on men's shoulders in puppyish convivial ways, right? This, this sort of sense of collective euphoria, but no one rested their head on Gatsby. Gatsby stood alone. There you get the loneliness of the quest for the American dream. So I always tell my student, it's the opposite of fake news, right? Fake news pretends it's real, but is actually false and trying to manipulate, manipulate you. Literature is, tells you it's make-believe, and yet it brings you to the truth. And that's why it's so powerful in explaining the American experience. Now, there's a wonderful philosophical explanation for this going all the way back to the ancient Greeks where Aristotle, the great Greek philosopher, put it so elegantly. He said, you know, history tells us what happened. It gives us the specific, the contingent. Literature gives us these imaginative universals. It tells us what could have or what should have happened, if we can find the truth in the make-believe. And I think all of the writers I want to discuss with you this evening, in one way or another, managed to create out of their fictional universes that sense of the truth, that sense of the real. So who are these chroniclers of the American uh, experiment of the American experience. I would single out um, several writers that I really think you would do well to give a, a look at. If, you, if you've read them, maybe reread them. If you haven't, give them a chance. Maybe this holiday season, writers who, to my mind, all say something essential about American life. The first one is one of my very favorite books about the American experience, and that's John Steinbeck and his Grapes of Wrath from 1939. This is a remarkable book. It's, um, you know, we, we like to think of, of America as an immigrant nation, right? And, and I think of my high school Latin teacher, the great Mr. Jos- Joseph Terranova, teaching us about the power of Latin prepositions, right? An immigrant is one who goes to a place. You immigrate to a country. An emigrant with an E is one who leaves a country, right? Um, But then there's another category, and that's the category that John Steinbeck writes about, the migrant, the one who 
neither leaves or goes to a country, but stays within the country and journeys to different parts of it. That's the world of John Steinbeck, the, the story of the mass migration from the Dust Bowl of Oklahoma in the 19th, you know, the, and during the, the years of the Depression, westward to the dreamland of California. But this is not, of course, the California of today with, you know, Silicon Valley and Hollywood. It's the California of finding work somewhere on a farm, trying not to starve. These, these, these good, honest people, the Jode family, in their quest to literally to survive, to fight off starvation, and the way in which they are dispossessed from their land in Oklahoma the way in which these faulty loans, these faulty financial, um, you know, um, the, 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 you know the, the great fallout from the Great Depression created this sort of devaluation of, of, ever, of everything. I believe the stock market lost something like 90% uh, from 1929 onward, and it, it didn't fully recover its value, if I remember correctly, until 1953. So this was an extraordinary period of hardship. And... What Steinbeck's novel does is it takes us inside this Jode family, J-O-A-D, and gives you a sense of how um, they, they not only try to survive, but they sort of articulate the hopes and fears of the working people in America in a time when there was so little opportunity to them, right? Um, there's, this, there's this wonderful quote on page um, 419, you know, where, where Tom Joad, who goes into hiding, uh, in, you know, he's, he's sort of becoming, he's developing consciousness of someone who wants to fight for workers' rights. He says, I'll be around in the dark. I'll be everywhere. Whenever you can look, wherever there's a fight so hungry people can eat, I'll be there right? I'll be there. I'll be in the way guys yell when they're mad. I'll be in the way kids laugh when they're hungry and they know supper's ready and those people are eating the stuff they raise and living in the houses they build. I'll be there too, right? This world in the in Grapes of Wrath of speaking about the struggles of the common worker, right? And, and, you know, Steinbeck writes earlier, and the great owners who must lose their land in an upheaval, the great owners with access to history, with eyes to read history and to know the great fact, when property accumulates in too few hands, it is taken away, right? This dream, this dream of a more equitable nation, I think that's ultimately what the, the surpassing brilliance of John Steinbeck's The Grapes of Wrath is about. The dream of equality in a time when there was so little of it to be had. And in a sense, that dream of equality is also at the very center of the next book I would recommend strongly to you as one of the great chroniclers of the American experiment. And that is Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man, from 1952. This is a, a phenomenal work that gives us the plight of African Americans. Um, it's the story of a Southern man, a Southern black man who comes to the North, uh, who leaves segregation, right? Who leaves literally the segregation of the South where, where there's overt um, mistreatment of him and comes to the North and he, he's hoping to find a better place. He moves to Harlem and this is wonderful chronicle of the Harlem Renaissance and, you know, all the artistic ferment when we think of the Harlem Renaissance and, you know, the dancers like Josephine Baker, we think of Duke Ellington, we think of the remarkable jazz music that came out of that. Well, this, this Southern man actually finds a different world where there's no literal segregation, it's, it's against the law, but in which he's still treated as an outsider, in which he still feels invisible, right? Right from the beginning of the book, we write, he writes, I am an invisible man, you know? Uh, no, I am not one of your Hollywood movie ectoplasms. I am, man of, I am a man of substance, of flesh and bone, fiber and liquid, and I might even be said to possess a mind. I am invisible, simply because people refuse to see me. 
I'll emphasize that last line. I am invisible because simply because people refuse to see me. And so this is sort of the main theme. Also, if you notice the beautiful writing of that, it, it has the quality of the improvisational riffs of the jazz music that um, that you know the the author is surrounded that the, the the protagonist is surrounded by in Harlem. It, 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 it's almost like prose that aspires to the condition of music. That's one of the great artistic achievements of Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man from 1952. The amazing thing about the book is that what Ellison captures is this quality of not being seen, of being invisible. In fact, we don't learn the identity of the narrator for the entire book. He gets involved in the um, political movement uh, to promote um, African-American rights in Harlem. He becomes quickly disillusioned with a lot of these political actions, and he sort of increasingly retreats into his own private world. But at no point in the novel do we get his name. He refuses to give his name. I think it's because it's an act of protest. Because he is not seen, he will not acknowledge the system by giving his own name. He chooses invisibility in addition to being having it foisted upon him. And to me, the most moving example of that is a scene he describes when he arrives in Harlem and takes the subway and looks around him and he says, you know, everyone was polite to me, um, but no one saw me. I felt unseen. And he said, I don't know what is worse. I'm paraphrasing. He says, I don't know what is worse, to be legislated against where it's out in the open or to kind of be informally treated as the eternal outsider, even though there's no law saying that, but it's still part of people's consciousness. People still refuse to acknowledge me as one of them. As a black person in a white person's world, he felt this sense of outsiderness. And that's ultimately the brilliance of the book, is to show how, you know, W.B. Du Bois, the great African-American scholar and author, said he talked about the double veil of consciousness, that for African-Americans, there was not, the difficulty was not just seeing themselves, but doing so in a way where they didn't sort of internalize the gaze of the other, the gaze of a kind of white society that kept them at arm's length in this period of structural racism. So I think that Ellison's book is an amazing way in which the person who feels like an outsider tells his story. Because that's the beauty of literature. Every time we hear someone's story, I think it becomes impossible to keep them at arm's length. I think stories bring us closer together. You think of Shakespeare, right? When um, in Othello, who's also, you know, an outsider, he's this, he's a dark skinned Moor that constantly references to his physical appearance and how he doesn't, you know, that he's an outsider in this Venetian society. And so when he, when Desdemona marries him, the senator's, call him to account and say, did you give her a potion? Why did she marry you? And Othello basically says, I narrated the story of my life. To hear these things with Desdemona seriously inclined. She, and then he says she felt compassion for everything that I, that I experienced. And that was what brought us together. Basically, Desdemona falls in love with Othello because of his story. And that is something that we'll completely see in our own books on the American experiment, the way in which stories have the power to bring people together. I think that's certainly the case in our next book. And now this is probably a book that many of you have read. This is a book that is, you know, truly one of the, you know, the great American novels, one of the most famous Harper Lee's To Kill a Mockingbird from 1960. I think it's a perfect way to segue from a conversation uh, about Invisible Man. And Harper Lee, right? Harper Lee writes about a world in which these, um, an African-American is, is, in, you know, is um, falsely accused. He's falsely accused of rape, uh, trying to rape Maya Yule. Um, and then Maya Yule's racist father, Bob Yule, gets in on the action and 
Um, Atticus pleads Tom Robinson's case. Um, the facts are all on his side, but somehow the jury ends up convicting Tom and he's sent away to prison where he tries to escape and then he's killed. So it's this sort of double tragedy of a travesty of justice, but also, you know, the death that results from trying to flee his captors. Now, the amazing thing about this book, it is about, it's certainly about issues of race, and, and I think that's familiar to anyone who's read the book. But I also think it's about a questions of justice, if you think about it, right? Atticus Finch takes on the case because he believes that Tom Robinson uh, deserves the, the fairness of legal representation and advocacy. He pleads his case, and um, he stands up for that ideal. Now, later on in the book, when Bob Ewell comes back and tries to kill um, Atticus and uh, Atticus's children, right, Scout and her brother, um, and uh, Boo Radley defends them, right? Before he figures that out, Atticus is willing to put his own son on trial for self-defense, right? He's a lawyer to the bone, you know? He's going to follow the letter of the law. But then what happens, right? Sheriff Tate comes in and says, you know, Atticus, to put Boo Radley on trial, a man for whom privacy is everything. Well, that would be like shooting a mockingbird, right? And that's where we get the title, To Kill a Mockingbird. This, this someone who was so delicate um, when it came to public scrutiny, who wanted to protect his privacy. And, that, um, and, and the amazing thing is Atticus, as I said, lawyer to the bone, accepts Sheriff Tate alternate version of history. I can't help but go back to our earlier, earlier conversation about Aristotle because there's a famous painting. I don't know if you've ever seen it, but it's in the Vatican and it's by Raphael. It's called the School of Athens. And it's basically a collection of the greatest thinkers in history. And right in the middle of the painting, there's Aristotle, you know, our, we can call him our patron saint of literature, um, and Plato. And Plato is pointing up to the heavens, saying basically humans are flawed. They'll never know justice on earth. We can only point to the heavens, these ideal forms. You know, humans can never know justice. They only have imperfect laws. But then we have Aristotle saying, no, Plato pointing to the ground. Observe the world around you. Yes, humans are flawed, but in their capacity to tell stories, in their capacity to make laws, they can create that sense of justice, as elusive as it may be. And I think that's what To Kill a Mockingbird does. It's basically saying that American society at the time did not give Tom Robinson justice. It falsely accused him. The system broke down on him. And so Sheriff Tate and Atticus take the system in their own hands and craft this alternate kind of made-up story, right, about self-defense and, you know, and, and um, leaving Boo Radley out of it and saying that, you know, Bob Ewell fell on his knife. And they create a version of history, I'm sorry, a version of justice that is somehow more truthful in their view than the actual factual version. I think this is one of the most remarkable things about Harper Lee's novel. It starts out making us think it's going to be about Boo Radley, you know, and how frightened the children are of him. It becomes a meditation on race in the South, and it ends with this soaring meditation on what we can call poetic justice vis-a-vis Sheriff Tate, Atticus, and Boo Radley. And I love the ending of um, Harper Lee's To Kill a Mockingbird because to me it reminds me of what literature does at its best. Basically, Scout walks Boo home, and she's for the first time on his porch. And his porch has been this threshold that none of them ever dared to cross, right, because they were so afraid of him, the kids. And she said, you know, neighbors give people things. Boo gave us things. We gave him nothing back. He actually gave them their life by rescuing them from Bob Ewell. And it's almost as though Atticus, I'm sorry, it's almost as though Scout is seeing the world for the first time through Boo's eyes. I imagine her up on that porch 
seeing the world through Boo's eyes. And I think that's what literature does at its best. You know, Atticus says, Scout, never judge a man till you've walked a mile in his shoes. We could add to that. Never judge a person until you've seen the world through their eyes. And literature gives us that extra set of eyes to see the world. Harper Lee, the next book I'm going to introduce, if there's a kind of kinship between Ralph Ellison and Harper Lee, and they're both discussing the same thing, the next book I'm going to rep- discuss is a chronicle of the American experiment is really far afield. And it may, might be one you haven't read. You may have heard of the author. Um, he's talked about less now than he was maybe 10, 20 years ago. But Thomas Pynchon's The Crying of Lot 49 I'm thinking this is probably the most difficult book on our list. It's a very, very demanding book, a very, very um, opaque book. And Thomas Pynchon was a very experimental writer. Uh, He's been, he's a very reclusive writer. There's really no, um, you know, very few um, photos of him. Even the ones that we have in circulation, people question. He lives sort of out of the public eye. He's very famous for his book, um, Gravity's Rainbow. He also wrote the book V. So he writes these sort of, I see him in the tradition of like James Joyce. You know, he writes these books that are almost like puzzles, right, that that is so hard to, to understand. The Cry of Lot 49 from 1965, I have to give you a sort of personal um, story about this. I was assigned this book in college when I was an undergrad, um, you know, all those years ago. And I remember being really um, frustrated by the book. I, I could barely make heads or tails of it. It's all I remember that was about, it's a story about this, um, the basic plot, which sounds very far fetched. It's about this um, wealthy man, uh, Pierce in variety, who um, makes a former lover who dies and makes his former lover Edipa, not Oedipus, but Edipa Moss, the executrix of his estate. And as she sort of tries to, you know, execute his lawful estate after his death, she gets involved in this labyrinth that takes her into this sort of, um, into the dark recesses of American society where she sort of discovers this alternate communication system. Imagine like the U.S. postal system and then this alternate world that is also sending messages, right? And it it goes back to this ancient European family, the Thurn and Taxis family, this noble family that set up this messaging system, this courier system. And she she, she sort of, and it introduces her to this sort of um, undercurrent of American society. Okay, you're thinking, I get it, Professor Lutzi. You know, John Steinbeck's Grapes of Wrath, that's about the class struggle. Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man, that's about historical legacies of racism. To Kill a Mockingbird, that also picks up on issues of race, but also discusses justice. How can Thomas Pynchon's The Crying of Lot 49 lead us into the discussion of the American experiment? Well, I think it does for the following reasons. Let me t- let's just repeat the date it was written, 1965. Great literature, I always believe, has this great predictive quality. It can almost anticipate the future. I think that's a little bit what Pynchon does with this book. This is before the full-blown, you know, explosion of youth culture in the 1960s. This is before the protests against the Vietnam War. This is before the explosion of drug culture, free love, right? When youth culture took over and and opened up, you know, attitudes towards sex, towards all these different things that were against the parents and their parents' generation in the the more domestic world of the 1950s America. It takes us into an America that is in transition. There's two really important ways that it does, and I think we can relate to them because I think they're quite alive today. One, it takes us into the world of conspiracy theories. We live in an age that is filled with conspiracy theories. We live in an age filled with misinformation. Now, 
We have social media. Thomas Pynchon didn't have that. You know, think of you know, the, the, the way in which social media, like the Facebooks of the world, can spread misinformation. That's what happens in Crying of Lot 49. But it's not Facebook spreading the conspiracy, or it's not Twitter, and it's, it's not YouTube. It's this alternate communication network right, um, which goes by the acronym WASTE, W-A-S-T-E, that's spreading all these dark theories. So we get a kind of glimpse into conspiracy, the mindset of conspiracy thinking, how conspiracy thinking works, and we also get the power of networks. Isn't that what defines our last decades in America, the rise of networks, the rise of internet groups brought together, people who used to be scattered, fringe groups, suddenly through the internet, they're able to create these powerful networks that affect elections, that affect policy, that affect the the cultural conversation. The way in which Pynchon describes the power of networks that coalesce around this alternate communication system, I think is very, think of something like Bitcoin today, right? What is Bitcoin? Just this currency that people agree has value, right? And they, they come together through the, through the, through the internet, through the sort of the, um, you know, through the, it's the digital currency and it, it's able to be created because of these networks, because of these communication uh, circuits. And it's very similar to what happens in the crying of Lot 49. I see it as the fusion of conspiracy culture and network culture. And those are two things that we, of course, in America today are all too aware of. The next chronicler of the American experiment is one that I just, um, I created this virtual book Club. Um, you, can, you can read about it if you like on my website, uh, josephlutzi.com, which is basically a group of readers who come together from all over the world. We, we meet once a month to discuss beloved classics or recent bestsellers. And last week, we focused on a major American chronicler of the American experiment, Joyce Carol Oates. Joyce Carol Oates is a woman who is remarkably, remarkably productive, right? She, um, she is one who is, you know, she, I think she's written 58 novels and 33 short story collections, numbers which just defy the imagination. She, she's, I believe she's around 80 now. She remains extremely, um, extremely prolific. She's still working hard. And she's someone who has said something, who said so much about um, American culture. What do you choose of hers? You know, to, she's written "We Were the Mulvaneys," which is about the rise and fall of the sort of uh, seemingly perfect American family that ends up really struggling massively because of a um, what sexual violence that one of the children experiences. Um, there's Blonde, a book of hers that is um, a book about the, Mar- the inner life of Marilyn Monroe. Uh, that, that's, I would say maybe those are two, two among her two best known ones. We, in my virtual book club, we looked at um, her recent collection of short stories called The Other You, which is um, you know, filled with some fascinating takes on con- contemporary American life. But the, the, book, the, the piece that I want to focus on in our conversation today is actually a different short story. It's by Joyce Carol Oates from 1966. It's called In the Region of Ice. I chose this one because I think it's Joyce Carol Oates at her best. She takes this outsider figure, this nun, and she, um, it's about a nun who teaches Shakespeare um, and at, the, at a local college. And one of her students is this brilliant student. Um, but he something she, she could sense not quite right with him. He's, he's had mental struggles with mental um, illness. Uh, he's, he's an outsider. He's a, he's a Jewish young man. And she could just feel that he's someone who has always felt apart from the world. And he's almost a little too forward with her. Not in a sexual way. We don't feel that their, their connection is sexual at all. It's more of an intellectual connection. 
he's quite brilliant and she's brilliant and they have deep conversations on Shakespeare. Um, but he, he tries to cross the line with her and, and establish a kind of personal connection that makes her a little uncomfortable because she's used to keep, keeping people at arm's length as a nun. Um, and she, you know, she even struggles with her faith. So she's someone who, who really has a sort of uh, troubled in her life. Well, at one point in the story, the boy's family, uh, the young man's family, has been institutionalized. And she finds out about it, so she goes to confront the family. And the story ends tragically. I won't tell you how. I don't want to spoil it. I urge you to read the story, but it does end in a horrible way. Um, so but what I want to talk about is, is the drive that Joyce Carol Oates takes out to visit the family of this young man. So she drives out to see his family. And she, this is Joyce Carol Oates writes, she drove nervously, uncertainly, afraid of missing the street and afraid of finding it too. For while, for while one part of her rushed forward to confront these people who had betrayed their son by institutionalizing him, another part of her would have liked nothing so much as to be waiting as usual for the summons to dinner, safe in her room. She's talking about life at the convent. When she found the street and turned on to it, she was in a state of breathless excitement. Here, lawns were bright green and marred with only a few leaves, magically clean, and the houses were enormous and pompous, a mixture of styles, ranch houses, colonial houses, French country houses, white brick wonders, with curving glass and clumps of birch trees somehow encircled by white concrete. Sister Irene stared as if she had blundered into another world. This was a kind of heaven, and she was too shabby for it. I love this image of this you know, this nun who is so insular, so interior, who's rejected the material world, suddenly confronted with these enormous homes, these pristine lawns, these vestiges of the American dream, economically speaking, and her feeling a world apart from them, her feeling cut off from that world. I think what Joyce Carol Oates captures here is that ability of this kind of the seductive power of American wealth, the, the promise of stability it seems to offer, the promise of durability, the promise of something lasting, untouchable, even beautiful. In reality, inside the house, there's nothing but turmoil. And she'll have this very contentious and fractious meeting with the boys, with the young man's parents. But that, that surface splendor of the homes and the yards that so captivates and seduces the nun, I think reveals much about the American obsession with upward mobility. We're back in Great Gatsby country, aren't we? The dream of material wealth and all that it confers. That's what this story captures in a small part as part of its larger diagnosis, its anatomy, if you will, of this complicated relationship between a nun and her star pupil. The final chronicler I want to talk to you about is one very current, right? You may have, uh, he's got a new novel out um, that is that's getting a lot of press, um, Jonathan Franzen, Jonathan Franzen, who, you know, Time Magazine put him on the cover and said, is he the great American novelist? Maybe, you know, who, who, who living can challenge Jonathan Franzen to that title? He sort of hits that sweet spot of critical success and commercial success. Many have commercial success without selling books. I'm sorry, many have commercial success without convincing the critics they're great. Many have critical success without selling books. Jonathan Franzen gets both. The book of his that I want to focus on is, actually, I think it it's might may be his best book. He's written some wonderful books, Freedom, uh, which is a very powerful novel. Um, 
you know, the um, purity, which I found less convincing than, than some of his other stuff, but still extremely well done. Um, but I think the corrections from 2005 um, really sort of stands out as, um, you know, Franzen's ability to kind of describe um, the life in America, life in America today. And um, there's the way he does it, he does it right from the beginning of the book. Um, it, 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 it's a story about a family in the Midwest. You, you know, you, 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 very, friends and very purposely makes it a typical family, whatever that means. We know this. We know that in the diversity of America, it's very hard to say, you know, any one group is, is typical, but it's, um, it's a, 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 you know, fairly well-off family, middle class, that is um, with three children. And they, on the surface, you know, it seems like they, the family has carved out a bit of the American dream. But that's just the surface because below the surface, everything goes haywire. And the novel is about, the, the, you know, the family struggle with the, um, the, the, the disease of the father, Albert, who has Parkinson's. Um, the struggles of the oldest son, Gary, who's financially well off, but struggles with depression. Um, the the middle son, the youngest son, Chip, who is a um, very talented writer, but whose life has really gone off the rails, and he ends up in a foreign country involved in some illegal activity. And the the daughter, Denise, who is a struggling with issues of sex of her sexuality and career and in a sense they're all in crisis in the family and i think franzen captures that right from the opening sentence right i'll read the madness of an autumn prairie cold front coming through you could feel it something terrible was going to happen the sun low in the sky a minor a minor light a cooling star Gust after gust of disorder, trees restless, temperatures falling, the whole, whole northern religion of things coming to an end. No children in the yards here, shadows lengthened on yellowing zoysia. Red oaks and pin oaks and swamp white oaks rained acorns on houses with no mortgage. Storm windows shuddered in the empty bedrooms and the drone and hiccup of a clothes dryer, the nasal contention of a leaf blower, the ripening of local apples in a paper bag, the smell of the gasoline with which Alfred Lambert had cleaned the paintbrush from his morning painter painting of the wicker love seed. So, I mean, what an amazing piece of writing. On the one hand, the most banal scene imaginable, right? Uh, just a regular old suburban town and the, the images of the wind whistling through the trees. But one gets the sense of the madness beneath the surface. One gets the sense of something ominous about to happen, that, you know, that, that this family is struggling to keep up appearances, and yet... Below the surface, so much lurks, so much lurks that is dangerous, that is, um, that is thre threatening and powerful. In, in a way, Franzen's novel and all the books that we discuss talk in some way about that, you know, implicitly and explicitly about this, what is the American dream, right? You know, we think of the Statue of Liberty, uh, give us your tired, your hungry, your poor, but we have to realize the American dream means different things at different times, right? I remember growing up and there was this show, Leave it to Beaver, right, where there was a uh, ward who would come home from work in his tie and, and his wife, June, was all dressed up at home uh, cooking and, and the two boys, Wally and Beaver, and their friends would come over. Of course, we live in a very different America today. The American dream, I think of the American dream as a story that is constantly being rewritten. It's never static. It's always in motion. And because it is constantly being rewritten, we need our greatest writers to help us create the plot lines, to help us develop the characters, and ultimately to help us fathom the complexities, the mysteries, and the wonders of this remarkable American experiment. Thank you so much for the chance to share these thoughts and ideas 
I look forward very much to our conversation. Thank you so much, Joseph. For those of you who are on the call and have a question for Joseph that you'd like to ask before we close out today, please follow the following Q&A prompts that are about to follow. Joseph, again, I wanted to say thank you so much for doing this call for our readers. Um, especially, it's always wonderful to have you, and especially out, you being our last call of the year. Um, it was well, a very what an honor. Thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. No, we love having you. And it looks like we do have a live question. Um, so let's go ahead and get to that. Um, you're on with Joseph. Great. Hi, Kimmy, and hi, Joseph. This is Bethany hi. Black. And, um, you know, I hate to say this, but ha with the popularity of podcasts, do you yes. think that Americans or people will start listening more than actually sitting down and reading? I mean, I'm the devil's advocate. Sorry. <laughs> no, thank, <laughs> but you. thank I would, you so much. I would love to listen to any of these books, and many of them, some I've read, but I just don't have time to literally sit down and read. So. I hear you. I hear you. So listen, a couple thoughts. One, I have no issue at all with audible with, with audiobooks. I think I call it it's all part of the ecology of stories, right? If you read it, you listen to it. I, I do I do believe something spe specific happens when one reads a book. There's something about the cognitive process of engaging with language that is different from hearing something, right? Um, there's something about mm -hmm. seeing the words on the page and processing them that I think really strikes to the heart of the literary experience. But if you mm -hmm. think about it, you know, the first great works, the first epics, they were all listened to. Homer's Iliad, Homer's Odyssey, those were oral tales. They weren't read. They were narrated by someone who told the story. And so the, those are great works of literature, and those were experienced through oral recitation and through listening. Similarly, think about when we're, we have our children, right? We often read to our children. Uh, children, that's how their first experience of books is through the wonder of hearing stories told to them. So I actually think books, audio books are a great development for readers. I do. I think that, um, you know, even have, uh, in, uh, there's, for example, take a really difficult book like James Joyce's Ulysses, which has frustrated readers over the centuries. I tell my students, listen to it. Just hear the language. You don't have to listen to the whole thing, but experience the brilliance of the language that will help you make sense of the book. Now, in terms of, I think in a way you're asking two separate questions. So listening to books I think is great. Podcasts and other forms of entertainment that aren't books, I think they are a challenge. Um, they are a challenge because, you know, in the old days, uh, you know, in the 19th century, people were waiting for the latest installment of Charles Dickens's new novel. Nowadays, they're waiting for the latest episode of their favorite Netflix series, right? So that's definitely true. Been, people are, you know, people, uh, I, I listen to podcasts too, and one of the things they often ask the guests, the guests, instead of saying, what are you reading these days? They'll say, what are you streaming these days, right? <laughs> and so uh, that's definitely, that, that is a challenge. But I would say this, people have been predicting the death of literature for centuries, for millennia. Mm. And literature always survives. It has a remarkable resilience. I, I discovered this with my, you know, this virtual book club I created. People from all over the world have joined. It, was, it, it, it came to life during the pandemic when a lot of people felt isolated. And the ability to connect over books is a powerful, powerful, um, has a powerful appeal. So I'm optimistic. I don't think that social media will destroy literature. I think that literature offers, you know, um, a superior experience. I always say, compare the face of someone who's been surfing the web for, for an hour to someone who's been reading a good book for an hour, right? The person surfing right. the web, they realize they just wasted a precious hour of their life. They're all, you know, they get that agitation from going from one website to another. 
someone who's read a good book is relaxed, the neurons are firing, they're at peace mm-hmm. with the world. So yeah. um, I, I am optimistic that great literature will not only survive, but will continue to flourish. Oh, I think literature will survive. It's just a different kind of receiving literature, rather reading versus, like you said, read to. That's right. That's right. And I think that as long as you're getting the story, it's all good. Right. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Beth Ann. Um, Joseph, we have another question that we'll get to before closing out today's call. Um, hi sure. there, you're on with Joseph. I'm sorry, I hope I'm doing this right. Um, Mr. You Lucy, are, are you receiving? Hi. Yes, sir, are you receptive to receiving a question through your website? Um, well, yeah, sure. Or you can just okay. ask me now. Um, I've got so many. I took so many notes. Um, I guess I've learned more about literature in your talk than I have in my entire life. I sense oh, wow. literature. Thank you. Yeah, I sense. I sense there's a difference, or that I know there's a difference between fiction and nonfiction. I yes. sense literature is more nonfiction in an effort trying to um, arrive at truth, where nonfiction is um, is telling the truth. I don't well, know that's if I said an interesting that right. point. I, I, I okay. think I, I understand what you're saying. I would make this distinction, and I appreciate the question. Okay. Literature can be nonfiction or fiction. For example, think of you know I mentioned The Great Gatsby by Fitzgerald, which is great literature. But George Orwell, right? He he was uh, he wrote fiction, 1984, Animal Farm, brilliant writer. He also wrote a lot of great nonfiction, homage to Catalonia, his reports from the Spanish Civil War, right? Um, he wrote some brilliant essays. He wrote a beautiful essay called Why I Write. So basically, literature is just great writing that society believes has value, you know, that society says this is, you know, this is, this is something that's going to stand the test of time. It can be fiction. It can be nonfiction. It's usually... You know, we, we associate a little more with nonfiction. But what, what, what it shares, whether it's fiction or nonfiction, is that ultimately they're both after the truth. You know, they're both trying to say something that is not evident in other areas of the world. And it takes courage to be a great writer. You know, the great John Paul Sartre, for example, the great French philosopher, received the Nobel Prize, the greatest prize in the world, right? Comes with a ton of money, comes with international fame and glory. Guess what? He declined the prize. Can you imagine? He says the writer must never accept public acknowledgement because that compromises the writer and makes him beholden to whoever's offering the gift that the writer needs to be independent. I think that that to me is like someone whose goal to pursue the truth will even they, they believe so powerfully in that that they'll give up fame and money along the way. And so whether it's fiction or nonfiction, they can both be literature, but in a way what joins them is that quest for the truth. Excellent question. Thank you. Okay. Can, may, I, may I follow up real quick? Sure. Y- yes. Is it, so what I'm hearing is that an engineer who believes that he has found truth but is not a great writer is that truth will never see the light of the day. I don't mean that exactly. I mean that, you know, there's different forms of the truth. We're looking, at, we're looking at books. We're looking at the printed page. The world of engineering has its own systems of truth, right? You know, you build a beautiful engine. You build, uh, you know, a, a great computer program. You, you change the world by, you know, uh, creating more environmentally safe products. Of course, you know, the engineering has its own uh, challenges. What I'm talking about more is in the world of all the material that we read, you know, you think of all the things that pass through, all the books published. I think there's like 
hundreds of thousands of books published in the United States every year, that only a select few of them do what they do so well that they'll stand the test of time, you know, that they will, they will last. A scholar actually studied this. A scholar at Stanford studied that of all the books written, about 99.5% of them basically disappear soon after they're published. So only like one in 200, you know, last. The standards are so high. Think of when you go to a bookstore, how many books are in there, you know, and someone's lucky to sell one of them, right? The, the, the competition is so fierce and ferocious. So those books that stand the test of time, all these books that we read today, they're the, they're the, the lucky few, the ones that have sort of, in the world of books and literature, entered that magical realm of the very select. So I'm not saying that other, other professions don't have their own versions of the truth. I'm more talking about an internal, internally to the world of books, that only a few of them attain the status of literature. I hope that explains things. Yes, thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for your question. Um, well, at this present time, we have no further questions, Joseph, so we can go ahead and close off today's call. Um, do you have any closing thoughts for our listeners? I would just say if I have any, uh, any, you know, any wish or any hope from this talk, which I hope you've enjoyed and, 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 and uh, found some interest in, it would be to get you thinking about books and maybe thinking about your own reading and maybe carving out a little more space for it in your life. You know, I wrote a, an essay. You can find it easily online. It's like um, the reader's rule of fours. It's basically like how can busy people find the time to read? And I give a few tips and a few suggestions. If, if I get people to think about books and read a little more, then I've done my job. Well, thank you so much, Joseph. And for everyone who's on the call, thank you so much for joining us today for our last call of the year. Um, For future events for 2022, please check out our rewards newsletter on Tuesday. And for those of you who receive our newsletter, our last newsletter of the year will be next Tuesday. Um, Thank you again for joining us today. We are very happy to have you as usual. Joseph, thank you once again. I'm signing off. Have a wonderful day, everyone. Thank you, Kimmy. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.